The purpose of this video is to demonstrate to Protestants that their pastors have a conflict of interest that priests do not have. I think that most non-prosper gospel Protestants would agree that this conflict of interest is obvious in megachurch pastors, where their entire gospel revolves around elevating their personal wealth. Now, I'm going to argue that the need to support their families, which they almost always have, and their livelihoods extends to all pastors, whether they're megachurch pastors or not. This is in contrast to most priests who take a vow of both celibacy and poverty, meaning they don't have a wife and kids to think about supporting, and they don't even strive to earn a middle-class lifestyle, ensuring that they don't have this conflict of interest. If you don't understand what I mean by pastors have a conflict of interest, it essentially goes like this. A Presbyterian pastor's job is to preach the Presbyterian gospel. A Baptist pastor's job is to preach the Baptist church's gospel. If for whatever reason a pastor realizes that they no longer believe what they preach, this is where that conflict of interest comes in because they're paid to, to preach a specific gospel regardless of what they believe. So my question to you Protestants is, how do you know that your pastor isn't dealing with this conflict of interest right now? How do you know for sure that your pastor didn't at some point realize that what they're preaching right now is wrong and that the only reason they continue to preach it is because being a pastor either is a big supplement to their income or is their only source of income and they just don't want to lose that? The following are clips of ex-Protestant pastors that have converted to Catholicism, all admitting that they had this conflict of interest. There is even one clip at the end of an ex-Calvinist pastor who just moved to a different type of denomination, admitting that he also had the same conflict of interest struggle to deal with our camp group in the Eucharistic liturgy or whatever and he took bread and he said Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said this represents my body broken for you and a lightning bolt hit me right in the chest and the Lord spoke to me and said Keith you know that's not what I said Jesus never said this represents anything he said this is my body I walked out of that out of that chapel went down front of the parking lot and I just began to be broken before God and I picked up my phone and I called my friend and I said, I think God's calling me to become Catholic. And he said to me, Keith, I'll do whatever I can to help you. And I was convinced that my life was about to change. Now you gotta remember something. This was my job. This was my career. This was the only thing I'd ever known how to do. This was all I cared about. And, and in about the 50 feet from the parking lot where I had that phone conversation to walking into that room, something changed within me. I walked in and I looked around and I saw my wife with our three little kids and our youngest in a stroller and she was wheeling them around. And I saw these 150 teenagers in there worshiping Jesus and this little voice inside my head said, Keith, are you really gonna blow all this up to become Catholic? Are you really gonna mess up your entire family and leave all these kids behind who are looking to you? Are you really gonna do that? Come on, Keith, you don't really wanna do that. And you know what? I'm, I'm sad to say, <clears throat> that's the voice I listened to. See, I wasn't willing to sell what I had to get that treasure in that field in that moment. I was looking at what I had and I was looking at what God wanted me to do and I was saying, you know, I'm pretty afraid of being obedient to God. See, there's a moment in your life, my friends, when you have to ask yourself, how much is obedience gonna cost me and am I willing to do it? And at that moment in my life, I wasn't. So I turned my back on my friendship with this guy. I didn't like break up with him officially as friends, but I just quit talking to him. I stopped reading the church fathers. I stopped thinking about the Catholic faith and I ran the other way as far as I could. And really what I ran into was a very deep, dark, depressing time of my life. See, I believed that my life had meaning because my youth ministry was so awesome and I could do all these great things for God. But when things started to tank, I started to tank and I wound up turning far away from God. I never lost my faith, but I lost my ministry because I came into this place where I realized that I had become more about me than I was about God. Uh, so I was a confused 
a young man. And I did meet that local priest, and he met with me for a period of time. And to make another a very long, longer story short, I can remember when I met with him again, he said, Shane, I, because we, we even asked, could I even become a priest? Is it possible? And he said, the only way to find out is to talk to the bishop. Well, the bishop was a no. Okay, mm-hmm. I accept that. And then the last time I met with him, he said, Shane, this is the exact words he used. You're nailed. I really <laughs> don't know what you can do. And then I remember leaving that uh, parish, and I thought to myself, I'm done with, the, with these ambiguous games. Just like by, when I converted, I'm either all in or I'm not. And I can remember leaving, I'm going to be a United Methodist pastor. Mm-hmm. I owe it to the people to whom I've been sent to be all in as a United Methodist pastor, to love these people, and to do what I can as faithfully as I can at that time. And I closed the door. Right. So you I did. I closed the to, door. To put those temptations towards Catholicism aside. I did. I Let did. me ask you, because you said earlier, I was terrified about Catholicism being true, I think you said, or scared to death. Uh, well, what, what, because I was in a what situation. What were you scared about? Well, what will I do for the rest of my life? Yeah, good. <laughs> That's a very practical concern. It's very yeah, understandable. Yeah, well, you know, this is what I, I mean. I, I, I became indebted uh, to you know Sally May so I could become uh, a pastor. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? Because I don't have any other marketable skills that I'm aware of. I can I can I can work in a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. that that's what was was terrifying to me, and it especially the door was especially closed after the birth of my daughter. I mean, I, that's we we I, I did not want to play with that. Now there there are going to be some people who say, well, you should have just trusted the Lord and done it. I get it, uh, but at the time in the environment in which I was in, I I just felt that I was betraying. Um, those people at, at Harmony whom I loved. Mm. That's what we need to get into. One of the reasons it's very hard for Protestant clergy to leave and to become Catholic is because they love the people they serve. And they love what they do day in and day out as well. But I shut the door and I had completely invested in uh, my ministry at the time. Did not look back. Did you seek to find ways to discount Catholicism? No. Like not only shut did. the door? No. If I did anything, I tried to seek ways to enlighten the people I served about some truths of Catholic doctrine. So, for instance, um, to show them that Mary has a critical role in the uh, our redemption. She's not a redeemer, of course, but she did collaborate with the Lord. Let's show them how. You know, I can remember, for instance, when I was introduced to uh, uh, Irenaeus' um, concept of the new Eve. Mm. Now, when I presented that to the Methodist people I was serving, they were very open to that. That made sense to them because you could draw on the scripture. You know, Christ yep. is the Adam, yep. you know, in Romans 7. Roman, and uh, in, if there's a new Adam, there must be a new Eve, and that she plays that part. So that's what I ended up actually doing. Question came in. What's one of the biggest fears for a Protestant to convert to Catholicism? What are you afraid to let go of, or is there mm. something with the Catholic faith you're afraid to go into? What, what was the uh, what was the the last obstacle, the the greatest fear that kept you from? I think I think it was very practical for me. It was like my livelihood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, it was my job. Yeah. And so I remember being at his residence, and I don't remember what we read. Something in the catechism that just really, really won me over, and I. I remember looking at him and I said, what am I going to do? And he said, mm. he said, he said, number one, he said, you have to trust God. And he said, number two, you have to quit your job as a pastor. How was I going to eat? And my wife was so worried. What are you going to do for a living? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. How are we going to pay the bills? Genuine concern. I don't know. What are you going to do when you get in the Catholic Church? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Still don't know. But I know who sent me there. I remember very clearly in my mind um, during our time in Vancouver was Chelsea and I uh, at a stoplight. She's, I don't know, four months pregnant or so. And out of nowhere she says, so when our kid is born, are we going to get him or her baptized? And I thought, oh my goodness, well, I, 
no, no, like I don't think we're going to, because at this time I'd already accepted this position coming back to, to work at this church, and this church is an Anabaptist church and they don't baptize infants, and, and I have to be honest and say that I was thinking of it very practically, I wasn't thinking in terms of right and wrong, what the Lord wants or doesn't want, I was thinking of, well, I, I'm working at a church that doesn't do that, so no, we're not doing that. And then, God bless my wife, because her pushback to that was, well, I don't care if you're working in a church that does that, like, what, what are you supposed to do? I remember kind of thinking, well, goodness, like, I, I don't know, like, I think this is what he wants, and I, and because I'd, I'd done so much kind of theological training at this point, it was pretty easy for me to say, well, here's the, here's the reasons why some people will baptize their babies, here's the reason why some people won't, but, you know, there's good reasons on both sides, but at the end of the day, we're just, we're not going to do it because I'm working at this church. And, sh and it struck her as just being so cowardly of me of like, really, that's the answer you're going to give me is just because we're, you know, there's good reasons here, good reasons here, and we're just not going to do it because of this church that you're planning on working at? Like, what, what if we're wrong? What if we should be doing this? What if we're withholding this huge, amazing gift and, and blessing from our, our kid? That was the first time where I started thinking of like, this matters, th and this is going to matter as we have more kids, as our kids grow up this kind of stuff is going to come up again and again and again because up until then it had been just me and then later on me and her and we could just kind of pick and choose how we wanted to approach things in the faith however we wanted and there was like i said there was nothing really at stake i found out it was going to take me it, it was a very fine restaurant but because of that everybody wants to wait tables at it you know and i found out it was going to take me like a year to get enough seniority to be on dinner shift and anyway i had some weird experiences i got to tell you one of them i was in the kitchen one day this is like about three months after I resigned the ministry and I was sitting there folding napkins. I was in the kitchen before the lunch shift, folding na napkins. And I was thinking about Martin Luther and I was thinking about some aspect of the reformation or, or whatever. And all of a sudden I heard someone yelling at me. I heard someone just like at the top of their lungs, like yelling, almost screaming really. And I looked over and my manager was standing there at the door and she was screaming at me to fold the napkins faster that I was folding the napkins too slowly. <laughs> and I had this like, I had this kind of like wake up moment where I was just standing there thinking, I was a senior pastor. I was in a church, you know, I was safe. I had a, an occupation in which I was safe the rest of my life. I used to get on airplanes and fly to pastor's conferences, you know, and now I'm folding napkins. And this woman who's like about a dozen years younger than me is shrieking yeah. at me. Yeah. Huh? is shrieking at me because I'm not folding them fast enough. And yet th this is what I'm thinking. And yet I, I, what I did was I, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologized. And I started folding faster. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm like, wow. So it was a kind of a feeling of what in the world did you do? Yeah. I had to make a decision. So I am used to saying that becoming Catholic was not as, was not as much as a choice but it was something that the facts demanded of me. I was scared to death when I realized that I had to become Catholic because my whole livelihood depended on that. I was a full-time pastor, so the church paid me a salary, paid my rent, my social security, my health insurance, everything. The way I provided for my family was by being a pastor. I did not, I was not a pastor because of the money, but I was a full-time pastor and I needed the money. And it was a, a struggle because I, I had wife, I had kids, and I had the obligation to provide for them. So I was very, very scared. But two things helped me during that process. The first one was I did not become a pastor because of the money, because of a paycheck. So if I did not become a pastor because of that, I cannot remain a pastor because of that. That was the first thing. The second thing was uh, God has promised to provide for me. It's not the church, it's not my job, it's not my paycheck that provides for me, it's God. And if as a result of my decision, I'll have to suffer, I'll consecrate that suffering to Jesus' immaculate heart. So that, that two things, that two thoughts helped me. And then I resigned my position at the Presbyterian Church. I spent uh, time without a job, without any money. 
my my relatives helped me a little bit. I went to live with my dad again. I was almost 40. Can you imagine? Like almost 40. I didn't have a f overnight. I didn't have a, a home anymore. I had to to go live with my folks, and they were very nice. But it's not. It's it's no one's dream <laughs> to come back to to their folks' home when you are almost 40. But it was God's provision. In my life and after a while I, I started working as a salesman for a company I was working on commission I didn't have like a salary but I was making enough to to make ends meet uh, I, I can tell you that uh, providing for my family was the biggest uh, fear that almost didn't let me become Catholic but I had to, to take a step of faith and God honored that. Also, uh, another struggles I had was with my flock because they were like, oh my gosh, our pastor went crazy. Uh, my relatives, especially from my wife's side, they are very committed to the Presbyterian faith and they were disappointed. Uh, my friends, all my friends, my whole life was structured upon the ministry. So it was like a social suicide, you know, I had to start over. But um, sometimes people say that I, I, I went back in the journey. And what I tell them is, if you realize that you are in the wrong way, going back is a wise decision. And I think it was like the next Sunday or something like that, we went back in to kind of meet with the church planning pastor. And I was like, I think I need to like, like, I'm good, I'm solid, I'm reformed, but I got to go find an answer to this. And he's like, do you need to find an answer? Or are you changing positions? You need to sort that out because you don't want to be planting a church when you're changing positions. And I'm like, $4,000 a month, I'm sure I'm just sorting it out, right? <laughs> like, it, like church planting funds, learn how you guys do ministry, there's, don't worry, yeah, I'll get this sorted. There's nothing about uh, like being paid by the people that are controlling what doctrinal stance you hold to to be able to be objective with it, that's for sure. Dude, which has become a whole new concern for mine. We'll get, we'll, I, we'll get to that, that's like future. Yeah. But anyway. I commend all these men for admitting that they have this conflict of interest. Not everyone can subdue their pride and humble themselves as they have. And as Jesus says, we need to do. Just like how I treat politicians, I immediately call into question the integrity of anyone that calls himself a pastor. Because first and foremost, I understand that what they're saying is what they're paid to say. And whether or not they actually believe what they're saying is yet to be determined. If you like this kind of content, uh, please subscribe and like the video, especially if you'd like to see more content like this.